shows were loved by millions, and the Ronnie's winning cocktail of characters, sketches and songs brought them huge critical acclaim alongside a massive viewing audience. <laughs> In 1986, Ronnie Barker stunned the world of show business by unexpectedly announcing his retirement. The two Ronnies special for Christmas Day in 1987 would be their last show together. But just before that announcement, the two Ronnies made their last series together. Not for the BBC, but nearly 11,000 miles away in Sydney, Australia. The programmes they made there have never been seen here. But tonight, you'll see, for the first time, recently discovered footage from the two Ronnie shows produced down under. Most of the sketches were written just for this series. A few were new reworkings of their favourite material first performed in Britain. But none of these two Ronnie's performances have been screened in full on British television before. There are the timeless characters we always loved. Moments that showcase the brilliance of Ronnie Barker. Good evening. I am the president of the Loyal Society for the Reef of Sufferers from Piss Pronunciation. <laughs> and routines capturing the dazzling charisma of Ronnie Corbett. Sadly, no more. I'm afraid he has finally been summoned to that great pantomime in the sky. He's gone to work for Qantas. <laughs> With sketches playing unedited at their original intended length, this is The Two Ronnies Unseen. The Two Ronnies' love affair with Australia began in 1979 when they were invited to tour their hit London Palladium show to Sydney and Melbourne. They did this absolutely fabulous show at the Palladium. Anyway, they said, would you fancy doing this in Australia? So the whole show was packed up and we went to Australia for a year. The two Ronnies were already big stars down under where their BBC shows had been screened for years. Now, the lure of the Aussie sunshine and a chance to live the Australian lifestyle for a whole year proved to be irresistible for both the Barker and Corbett families. Ah, oh, we fell in love with Australia straight away. Where we lived was beautiful house right on the harbour. So yeah, the pool went out and then there was the wooden wharf, and then you, we did used to jump into the harbour and swim down the road to the neighbours. We saw a lot more of the Corbett's when we were in Australia than we ever did in England, which was absolutely lovely, because we all got on so well. It was a golden time. The sun, the sea, the sound, the outside, you know, all the things that you don't get in North London. In addition to the shows with Ronnie Barker, Ronnie Corbett fulfilled some solo engagements while in Australia, including a special night that led to a fortuitous meeting. Ron did his act at the Sydney Opera House, which was, you know, quite a big happening. And David Frost was there, and he bought Kerry Packer. He owned Channel 9. So that's how he met Kerry Packer. Packer and Corbett became friendly in the years that followed. And then in 1986, while on his own Australian tour, Ronnie had a brainwave. How about doing a special series for Australia and I had a word with Ronnie Barker about it and Ronnie was up for it he said, what a good idea. Kerry Packer asked Ronnie C to go to his house the next day and um, Ronnie C had this idea about the two Ronnies doing an Australian TV series and uh, apparently Kerry Packer on the spot went, yes, we want it. Kerry Packer's Channel 9 was Australia's number one TV network in the mid-80s. Home of the biggest shows and the brightest stars, including now the two Ronnies. So sit back and enjoy the best of the two Ronnies down under. George. What? If you had three wishes, what would you wish? I'd wish for three more of these. <laughs> Very romantic, are you? I mean, no, I mean, don't you ever just, you know, want to get up and go? I would if I drunk three more of these, yeah. <laughs> travel. I'll travel, yeah, yeah. I'd like to travel, yeah. Where do you want to travel to, then? Well, I'll give you a clue. Yeah. What is big and warm and friendly? Hey? <laughs> what is big and warm and friendly? You a missus, you mean? Or <laughs> Australia. Australia. Oh, that's right. That would be nice. That really would be nice. Do you believe wishes come true, then? No. <laughs> it try though, isn't it? <laughs> George. <laughs> Sid, you've still got two wishes left. 
<laughs> Better wish for a couple of surf. <laughs> hey? So I'll have a mouthful. Oh, sorry, I only brought you a pint. <laughs> what is the difference between a pint and a litre? That's what I say. What's the difference? <laughs> they got an extermination here at the pub tonight. What do you mean, extermination? Well, they're going to stay open an hour after they shut. <laughs> that won't bother me. I'm off down to Pig and Whistle. Oh, I've never been down there. How far is that? Well, it's about four miles, but if you hurry, you can do it in two. <laughs> what's that? What's that letter you've been reading? That? Then? That's a letter from my girlfriend, that is. Oh, really? Yeah. Nice. <laughs> well, there's no writing on it. No, we're not speaking. <laughs> <laughs> my girlfriend's got a job down the museum. Oh, yeah? Do you know there's a set of dinosaurs' bones in the museum which are two million years old and three months? How do you make that out? Well, she's been there three months and there were two million years old when she died. Oh. <laughs> Here, have you seen them two skeletons down by the door in that museum? Yeah. The big one's Nelson, you know. Oh, really? Yeah. Who's the little one? That's Nelson when he was a small boy. <laughs> Beer's terrible, you know. I'll be glad when I've had enough. <laughs> I'll be better off drinking milk. Oh, don't want to drink milk. Don't want to drink milk. Milk very dangerous, what? you know. My brother died drinking milk. Really? Oh, the cow fell on him. <laughs> <laughs> my other brother, my other brother, he died of women and drink. Did he? Who was that? Couldn't get either, so he shot himself. <laughs> Hey, what's the time? I don't know. I haven't got a watch. Oh, I have. <laughs> what, what are you asking me the time for when you've got your watch in your wrist there? Well, I don't want to wear it out. Keep looking at it. <laughs> Has it got a guarantee, that watch? No, no, but the man in the shop was very nice. He said, if ever I had any trouble with it, all I've got to do is fold him up and he'd tell me what time it is. <laughs> I had trouble with my budget last week. Trouble? What kind of trouble? It drowned it. Oh, dear. <laughs> I told you not to keep it in that goldfish bowl. Oh. <laughs> you should kept it in the birdcage like everyone else. I did, didn't I? But the water kept running out. <laughs> <laughs> my dog died, you know. Well, when was that, then? Well, if he'd lived till tomorrow, he'd be dead a fortnight. <laughs> I've had that dog since a week before he was born. <laughs> How can you have a dog a week before he's born? He was born a week early. <laughs> My sister had a baby this week. Girl or a boy? Oh, she's a girl. Boys can't have babies. <laughs> no, I mean, was the baby a girl or a boy? Oh, I don't know. Don't oh, so you don't know whether you're a uncle or a aunt, then, do you? <laughs> What are you going to buy for a christening present, Well, then? I'm going to buy a pram. Oh, yeah? A new pram. I'm going to buy it on the new hire purchase scheme. What's that? 100% down and nothing a week. <laughs> oh, you know, when I was born, I only weighed two and a half pounds, you know? Oh, that's terrible, that is. Did you live? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you should see me now. <laughs> Here, I'll tell you something. I've got 200 more bones in my body than you have. How is that? I had a kipper for me breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> We've had ten pints here. Yeah. Shall we go down and have one at the Swan? No, I can't wait. I'm going to have one behind the bushes. <laughs> It's the two Ronnies Unseen, showcasing their work performed in Australia and seen here now for the first time. I'm afraid we're cornered, Corporal. Yes, sir. We should be lucky to get out of here alive. Oh, later than that, sir, I shouldn't wonder. Well, later than five, sir. Probably half past, sir. <laughs> I said lucky to get out alive, not to get out by five. 
Oh, I'm sorry, sir. It's the gun, sir. Yes. Gun, sir, can't hear you properly, sir. You see, with the guns. I know, I know. Are we cut off from the other, sir? Yes, I'm afraid we are. Yes. <laughs> Listen, we can either lie low till morning, or you can climb to a high vantage point and see if you can spot the enemy. What do you say? Thank you very much. No, 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 no. What do you think of it? Oh, uh, well, well, it's up to you, sir. I think you'd better get up a tree and risk it. Oh, thank you. I could just do with one, sir. One more. <laughs> a cup of tea and biscuits. <laughs> I said get up a tree and risk it, man. <laughs> sorry, sir, sorry. Well, go on, make a start. Make a start, sir. What make a start. <laughs> make a start. What's the matter with you? Do I have to repeat every stupid little word? Well, sir, no need to, no need to be personal, sir. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> me that, what you did, sir. <laughs> I said stupid little word. Oh, oh, sorry, sir. I thought... <laughs> sorry. Well, go on, get on with it, Corporal. <laughs> sir, sir, I can't climb trees. What? I can't climb trees. Never could. Ever since I was a small boy at Wimbledon. You never told me that. What's that? You were a ball boy at Wimbledon. <laughs> Tennis. What? Dennis the cook, sir? Tennis, man! Tennis! <laughs> oh, never mind all that. Listen, up there on the ridge, yeah. there is a tank. Now, we've got to go up and recapture it, right? Yes, sir. But watch out for snipers. Anywhere near a tank is a hotspot. Oh, I don't think we are, sir. What? Anywhere near a Lancashire hotpot, sir. <laughs> hotspot, I said. Hot. What's the matter with you? You're obsessed with food, man. <laughs> sir? Yes? I, I can't go, sir. What? I can't go. Why not? My gun's gone wonky, sir. <laughs> well, it's only natural. So is mine. It's nerves, that's all it is. <laughs> Hello, my gun, sir. Oh, your gun. Oh, your yes. gun. I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, sir, it was, it, was, it, was, it was in my trouser pocket. It went off half cock, sir. <laughs> oh, dear, you better see Matron when we get back to Casualty about that. <laughs> well, I suppose I'd better go myself. Be careful up there, because they're different. Oh! oh. You all right, sir? No, of course I'm not all right. I'm shot. Well, it is hot, sir. We're shot! All... <laughs> shall, I, shall I get the stretcher bearer, sir? No, no, it's too late for that. Just go and let me die in peace. Yes, sir. Any gravy on it at all, sir? <laughs> <laughs> what? Any gravy on your pie and peas, sir? <laughs> well, I said, let me die in peace, not get me pie and peas. <laughs> oh, never mind, never mind, Corporal. You're That's not right. such a bad chap. We haven't always seen eye to eye. Or ear to ear, for that matter. <laughs> it's the gun, sir. But at least... If you get out of this mess alive, they'll say I died saving an ordinary man. Save you what, sir? An ordinary man. Yes, sir, I will, sir. You will what? When I get back to the mess, I'll save your strawberry plants. Oh. <laughs> Do you think that marriage is a lottery? No. In a lottery, you do have a slight chance. <laughs> but you like women, don't you, eh? Oh, yeah, yeah. Just give me my pipe and the great outdoors and a beautiful girl, and you can keep the pipe and the great outdoors. <laughs> Phil, that ain't stuffy to do with marriage, is it? That's just the opposite sex. To what? <laughs> you know what the opposite sex is, don't you? Yeah, it's that tart who lives across the road. <laughs> Yeah, talking of which, my sister-in-law has just had quads. Oh, that's pretty rare, isn't it? Very rare, oh, certainly is, yes. Doctor says it only happens once in one million six hundred thousand times. Blimey. So why does she ever found time to do the housework? <laughs> I am the president of the Loyal Society for the Relief of Sufferers from Piss Pronunciation. <laughs> for people who cannot say their worms correctly. <laughs> or who use the wrong worms entirely, so that other people cannot underhand a bird they are spraying. <laughs> it's just that you open your mouth and the worms come turbling out in boxes. <laughs> that you dick not what you're thugging a bit. <laughs> and it's very distressing. I'm always looing it. And it makes one feel uncomfortable. <laughs> Especially when one's, one's going about one's diddly tasks, slopping in the slooper market for ink stands. Only last wonk I approached the chuck-out point. <laughs> and I 
I showed the ghoul behind the crash desk <laughs> the, uh, the contents of my trilly, and she said... <laughs> she said, all right, Grandad, shout him out. Well, of course, that's fine for the ordinary man in stoat, who has no dribble with his warts. <laughs> For someone like my slurf, it's worse than the kick in the jackstrap. <laughs> I mean, sometimes you get stuck on one letter, such as wobble you, you see, and I said, uh, well, I've got a tin of whoop, a woocumber, two packets of wheeze, and a wallyflower. <laughs> and then she tried to make fun of me and said, that would be woo pounds, wifty wee pen. <laughs> so I just said wobblers and walked out. But you do see how dicky felt it is. <laughs> but help is at hand. The new society has been formed by our mumblers to help each other in times of excreme ices. <laughs> it is bald piss months is unanimous. <laughs> Anyone can ball them up on the smelly phone at any time of the day or no. <laughs> 24 flowers of spray, seven stays a creek, and they will come round and get drunk with you. <laughs> For foreigners, there will be impertwitters who will uh, all squeak many sandwiches, such as uh, <laughs> the Swedish, Turkish, Burkish, Jewish, gibberish, and rubbish. <laughs> Membranes will be able to attend tight stool or heaving classes. <laughs> to learn how to grope with the many kaplinkities of day. <laughs> Which brings me to the drain reason for squeaking to you tonight. <laughs> the society's first function as a body was a grand garden freight. And we, we hope for many more bodily functions in the future. <laughs> The garden plate was held in the grounds of Sydney University. And the guest of horror was the great American pip singer, Manny Barlow. <laughs> the plate was opened by the external affairs P minister, Mr. Andrew Shadowcock. <laughs> who gave us a few well-frozen worms in praise of a society's jerk and said that in the creaks and stunts at thy head, we must all do our nut roast to ensure that it sucks weeds. <laughs> And everyone visited the various stalls and abruzements, the rudabouts, the thing boats, and the dodgers, and of course all the old favourites such as the cokish eye nuts, stry your length, guessing the weight of the cook, and tinning the pail on the wonky. <laughs> The occasion was great fun, and in short, I think it can safely be said that all the men present and thoroughly good women were had all the time. <laughs> so please join our society. Write to me, Dr. Smallpith, <laughs> the spanner. Poke Moses, and I will send you some brieflets to browse through and a brass badge to wear in your loophole. And a very good night to you all. Good night. <laughs> Oh, yeah. What can happen? Oh, that's very kind of you. I'll have a pint. What, what, what a pint light? No, pint, pint of brown. No, pint of margin. No, pint of bitter. Pint of bitter, yeah. Pint of bitter, John, would you? Pint of How are you? I'm seeing you up the factory lately. Well, you've been all sick, have you? No, no, well, I packed it in, didn't I? Oh, did you? Oh. Yeah. Yeah, well, they wanted me to change my... What, uh, change your hours? No, change my... Uh, change your habits, was it? No. <laughs> change your socks more often. No. <laughs> change my duties. Oh, your duties, did they? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, I didn't want to do that. No, no. It's a quite cushy little number, you know. It was yeah. quite a good uh, good job. Yes, you know? it was a lovely job. Thanks, John, thanks. Yeah. There you are. Yeah, what about Cheers. Cheers, cheers. I've, uh, I never really know what sort of uh, what sort of job you did up there. What job did you do up there? Well, the same job as I'd done for 20 years, Oh, did you? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I always worked with... Um, what, with uh, with pride? No, with... Uh, <laughs> within, within reason? No, no. No, with, uh, with, uh, with your overcoat on. <laughs> I always work with Harry Hawkins. Oh, Harry Hawkins. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, he used to uh, always work with him. He yeah. used to give me his... Um... His wholehearted support. No, he used to give me his... What, his athletic support? <laughs> no, he used to give me his ginger nuts. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, he used to give me his ginger nuts, and I used to dip him in... Um... In his tea for him. <laughs> no, in the chocolate. Oh, the chocolate. Oh, yeah. I see. That was the job, was it? That was the job. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Harry and I made the only ginger nuts, oh, and there was the chocolate it. on Oh, right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and somebody, yeah. Yeah, somebody realised, or yeah. thought, a yeah. lady could do the job, a woman, you see. Mm. So uh, they decided to do that, and they put me on... Sh short time? No, on... Uh, what, short cake? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> sherbet fountains. Oh, sherbet fountains. <laughs> Now, that is a real message of the yeah. sherbet, because yeah. that sherbet gets everywhere. Does it, yeah? Yeah. You know, you go home and um, start stripping off, yeah. and you find you've got a coating of sherbet all over the... Um... All over the weekend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the wife don't like it. No, no. Oh, well, that makes it worse, because you can't even... No, exactly, no. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um... Anyway, this uh, this woman, she yeah. decided that she uh, didn't want to work with Harry Hawkins. Oh, did she? Yeah. Oh, oh, did. She didn't like the way he handled his... His um, ginger nuts. No, <laughs> no his, his machinery. Oh, his machinery. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, she thought he was, um... Was nuts? No, she thought he was, uh... What, ginger? No, incompetent. Oh, incompetent. <laughs> I see, so uh, so you went back with Harry then, did you? No, no, I decided I had enough. Oh, did yes. you? Oh, so yeah. I went back home, you know. Yeah. Then found the wife was up, uh... Up, uh, up to her knees in sherbet. No, no. <laughs> Up to her old tricks with the milkmans. No. <laughs> no, she was up her mother's. Oh, up her mother's. <laughs> so I then and then thought, I'm going to go to the job centre. Oh, yeah. I thought, go to the job centre, because yeah. it was a good job you're after. That yeah. is the place to... Um... To steer clear of. No. <laughs> No, they're quite good, some of them, you know. Mm. My brother-in-law went for a job as a removal man, yeah. and within a week, they'd already given him a... Um... A fortnight's holiday. No. <laughs> what, his own set of tea chests? No, no, no. No, no a double hernia. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I went up to this job centre place. Yeah, yeah. And a very nice place, wasn't uh -huh. it? Yeah. 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 And they got this girl there, yeah. Yeah, sitting behind a sort of grill. Oh, yeah, grill, oh, yeah. And she's filing her... Filing um... her nails. No, no, filing uh, her... What, what, filing the bars, trying to get out, was it? No, no, no. <laughs> filing the jobs. Oh, filing the jobs. The jobs, yeah. in the portfolio, Oh, I see, see. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, she's very nice, very big girl. Oh, big girl, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, she's yeah. got these two... Yes, yeah, uh... so I'll get the picture, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Either side. Well, they would be, wouldn't they? Yeah. <laughs> and I mentioned the job. Yeah. yeah. And they sprang up. Did they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What caused that? Well, I don't know the general excitement, I suppose. Oh, really? And, yeah. and then they came towards me. Did they really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, these yeah. two. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Yeah. 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 These two. What do you call them again? No. Um, what are you called? Clarks. Oh. <laughs> 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 I've got the wrong picture entirely there, oh, you know. <laughs> no, these two clerks, yeah. they said that this girl yeah. um, uh, was a trainee. Oh, yes, I see. Trainee, that. basically, yeah. who had just got off the... Um... Off the train? No, no. <laughs> off the course. Oh, off the course, of course, yes. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And the two uh, clerks, that I uh, Dad mentioned mm. to you, tell you about before, they said, if it's a job you're after, we yeah. have a vacancy. Oh. Yeah, because we're looking for someone with short... Short uh... legs? No, no. Mm. With... No. <laughs> <laughs> No, we're short... Uh, short shirts? No, no, we're short... Short Cummings? Yeah, no. No. We're short hand and typing. Oh, I see. Yeah. <laughs> they wanted someone with short hand yeah. because they were... Uh, Short-handed? No, no. They were understaffed at the town hall. Oh, see. yes, I see. So you never got the job? Didn't get the job. Didn't it. get the job, no. can't do it. So you're out of work? You're no, not in... entirely, no, because oh, no. there was another job. Yeah. Another vacancy which I accepted. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I'm working in the sweet... Um... Well, in the sweet factory, you know? No, no, oh, no. In the city, city oh, yeah. job. In the, in the sweet... Um... Well, Sweet smell of success, is it? Well, hardly. <laughs> I'm in charge of the gents at Central Station. <laughs> <laughs> Humphrey, what is it, Godfrey? Who is that terrible, ugly woman you were with today? That was my sister. Oh, of course, I should have noticed the resemblance. <laughs> Just got married, hasn't she? Yes. Mm. And do you know, she's married a man whom people invariably take an instant dislike to. Oh, why is that, do you think? It saves time. <laughs> <laughs> They've just moved to Cheltenham, you know. She loves Cheltenham. She says in Cheltenham, breeding is everything. Yes, well, we enjoy it in Kensington as well. We also have other interests. <laughs> the funny thing is, although he's a bully, an idler, and a drunk, she intends to have 17 children by him. Good grief, why on earth does she want to do that? Well, she says she's hoping to lose him in the crowd. <laughs> Uh, forgot my glasses. Uh, <coughs> never mind, I forgot my glasses, never mind. <clears throat> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are gathered here this evening to honour George and Gloria, who today celebrate 20 years of mad bliss. <laughs> Mary, Mary bliss. <laughs> 21 years ago, George turned up with this beautiful and charming representative of New York. Big part, New York. Theirs have been a fairly stale romance. <laughs> a fairy, a fairy tale romance. 
<laughs> he a typical English country squirt. Squirt. <laughs> A struggling Broadway hooker. <laughs> hoofer, hoofer. In other words, a danger in the chorus. George first saw her in the musical Hello Doggy. <laughs> and the moment the curtain was down, began to ravish her. R -r -r <laughs> lavish, lavish her with every attention. Showering her with red noses and giving her germs. Germs. <laughs> Till at last, at the altar, she said the words he'd been waiting to hear, I do, and threw up. <laughs> her career. Oh, threw up her career. <laughs> Naturally, when George gave us the news, we were over the moron with delight. <laughs> Gloria, 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 as we know, comes from a fine old American family. Though her grandmother, we are told, was a kept woman. <laughs> and a Kent woman, a Kent woman. <laughs> she herself, you will all agree, is a great lay. Lady, lady. <laughs> Only one word describes her. Skin. Saint. <laughs> As lady of the manor, she never shirted her dirties. <laughs> Shirked her duties. Visiting the tenants in their holes, in their homes. <laughs> and tending to their warts. <laughs> they want. They want. <laughs> like her, Gloria is looked on by all the sundry as a fiend, as a friend. <laughs> oh, and I should never be forgiven if I vomited to mention her cooking. <laughs> the, the feathery lightness of her uh, buns, buns, <laughs> and the split second timing of her rubber beans. <laughs> and as we all know, after that delicious meal, her speciality, roast jerky and chipolatas. <laughs> the whole meal was absolutely uneatable. <laughs> Unbeatable. <laughs> we now come to George, himself a bit of a crook, a cook. <laughs> Shale Spear said, and I quite, <laughs> one man in his time Please, many pants. Pass. <laughs> and George certainly has had his share of girls. Uh, in fact, he was considered at one time quite a wilf. He was slimy <laughs> then. I'm sorry, sorry, slimmer, slimmer then. <laughs> always, always a faithful friend. He is a true toady. <laughs> He's a true toady. <laughs> he is as true today. <laughs> one of the yes men of England, one of the you men of England. I could go on all night. <laughs> but instead, I shall gum up by saying, there were never such a couple of sweaties. Sweeties. <laughs> to George and Gloria, as we say at the Bridge Club, two aches, aces, who together are a perfect pain. A pair. <laughs> Tonight, I am a little bit excited because I have reason to believe that my new Channel 9 pay rise has just come through. To be honest, my last pay rise was nearly six years ago when I stormed into the programme controller's office and demanded that they pay me what I was worth. <laughs> $42 a week doesn't go very far. <laughs> Oh, my God, it is pathetic. $42 a week when you consider that the producer upstairs is earning nearly twice that. <laughs> so this, this week, I took a militant stand and put in a claim for a 5% increase, and it's obviously shaken them up a bit because I have just had this top-level memo delivered to me personally. Actually, it's still a bit crumpled, you know. Still a bit crumpled from where it was wrapped round the brick. But... <laughs> Let's see what it says here. From the president of Channel 9 to Mr. Robbie Cornett. <laughs> you see, right from the top. <laughs> At last, I'm about to be treated with a little respect and deference, as befits a man of my professional status. What is your game, squib face? 5% <laughs> pay rise. I should Coco Titchy. <laughs> Call yourself a comic. We could train a chimp to do what you do. If you're a comic, I'll walk to Perth with a leaky water bag. <laughs> I... <laughs> That's how I treat letters like that. <laughs> Particularly if they don't get laughs. <laughs> now, on to tonight's story, which I have decided to tell as a mark of respect 
to my old uncle Brutus, who was one of the great characters of show business. For 25 years, his widow Twanky was a legend <laughs> throughout Parramatta. But <laughs> sadly, no more. I'm afraid he has finally been summoned to that great pantomime in the sky. He's gone to work for Qantas. <laughs> No, he hasn't. That would be ridiculous. He is actually dead. Now, <laughs> to, to be honest, he was rather a comical-looking character with a very flat face and an incredibly big pointed nose. And when they died, they used his head as a sundial. <laughs> it's very interesting because his late brother, my late Uncle Horace, that was, was also in panto, pantomime, he spent 40 years playing Humpty Dumpty. And I remember his cremation was held up for nearly half an hour while someone went to fetch an egg timer. <laughs> No, I've got, I've got a strange uncle. I had an uncle, I had an uncle Gladys once, um, <laughs> who had a nasty accent in a sawmill. And <laughs> he was a world record holder. He was the only man who'd ever slid down Mount Everest on a tin tray. <laughs> and they buried him where he came to rest. <laughs> Just outside Rooty Hill. <laughs> When I think of it, it's been quite a bad year for bad news, all told. I mean, last Sunday morning, for instance, there we were all at home, taking things easy. My little nephew was sitting on the carpet, playing with his tonka, and my... <laughs> <laughs> my wife was upstairs in our daughter's playroom trying to smoke an encyclopedia salesman out of the doll's house. <laughs> it was a very, very cold morning. I, I remember, very cold. We had to kick-start the Rice Krispies. <laughs> and I just settled down after breakfast uh, with the Sunday newspaper. Or was it the Telegraph? Anyway, and I, was, I, was reading, I, I was reading one of their thrusting, in-depth theological dissertations about a vicar who was caught on the church roof with a Avon lady. <laughs> Ding-dong merrily on high. <laughs> Suddenly, we heard that the chap next door had just been rushed to hospital. It's all very tragic because he was a businessman who was very big in kitchen equipment until his accident. Uh, <laughs> he fell on top of a Kenwood blender and liquidated his assets. <laughs> <laughs> but I digress. On with this story. Now, this story concerns a little old lady who, by coincidence, has also just lost her husband. And she decides that for some companionship, she will buy herself a dog. Uh, you know, we all like pets. And uh, I remember when I was a boy, we were so poor, I, we used to have very cheap pets. You know. <laughs> For my seventh birthday, my parents bought me a semi-detached tortoise. <laughs> <laughs> my, my father couldn't, affo couldn't afford... My father couldn't afford a homing pigeon, so he had a budgie on elastic. <laughs> <laughs> so this... This old... This old lady... This old lady goes down to her local pet shop and the assistant behind the counter says, I have got the ideal companion for you, said madam. He said, a nice little puppy, only six months old. Uh, so she looks at it, she says, yes, that's very nice. She said, very nice, very nice. She said, do you think it will replace my husband? I mean, you know, <laughs> said, my husband was a warm, he was affectionate, and he was always doing little jobs around the house. Said, <laughs> <laughs> In that case, this is definitely the dog for you. I, uh, <laughs> I, did try, I did try to say that quickly. Anyway, she said, well, I'll tell you what. If the dog doesn't mind, I'll take it. So they asked the dog, and the dog said, yes, that's absolutely fine. <laughs> and off they go. There you are. You see a talking dog. Already the joke has got novelty value. <laughs> that's about all it has got, but anyway. <laughs> now, to cut a long story short, the lady becomes devoted to this dog, and every afternoon at tea time, regular as clockwork, she takes him for a walk down to the newsagents for her evening paper. Well, one day, many years later, her legs are getting a bit crotchety, so she calls the dog in and she says, Now, listen, Tiddles. <laughs> I don't think her eyes were too good either, anyway. Listen, Tiddles, if I give you the money, do you think you could go down and get my evening paper tonight on your own? And the dog says, yes, I could do that, no bother. <laughs> and I just made that bit up. Anyway, he was actually, he was, he was, could, could you carry, thank you. He was actually a very intelligent and perceptive animal. During the last election, Barry Unsworth came round to the house canvassing. And the dog made such a brilliant job of conducting its own defence, the judge ordered Mr. Underworth to be destroyed. <laughs> so she gives it... Oh, my God! So... So she gives... 
She gives him the money for the newspaper. She says, now, you're sure you don't mind? And the dog says, no, I don't mind at all. Because <laughs> he's got the money in his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and he waddles off down the road while well, four hours go by and there's no sign of him. My God, she thinks, perhaps he's been kidnapped. <laughs> oh, perhaps, perhaps he's got tangled up in a toilet roll somewhere. <laughs> oh, well, it happens. Anyway, so she throws on her hat and coat and she begins combing the streets and eventually, just as she's passing a dingy little alleyway, she hears this scuffling noise. And there, to her horror, is her little dog with the little lady dog, as it were, <laughs> you know, having a good time amongst the dustbins, you see. <laughs> so well, she, she grabs a nearby bucket of water, throws it over them, and then drags the dog to one side. She said, well, she said, really? I've never seen you do that before. And the dog looks up and says, well, I've never had the money before. <laughs> in her cheeks oh, and the ribbons in her hair and the rosebuds on her lips and that lacy underwear oh the dimples in her cheeks <laughs> there's a girl who lives near me pretty as a pin whenever i go by her place she always lets me in she's a gal without no brain she's simple so they say but when I take her in the woods, she always knows the way. <laughs> oh, the dimples in her cheeks. Oh, the cheeks. And the sunburn on her knees. And the sunburn on her knees. And the music in her voice. And she tries so hard to please. Oh, the sunburn on her knee. <laughs> when first we met, she was wearing pants and pushing an old iron plow. At first I thought she was a boy, but I don't think so now. Sometimes we go for buggy rides and other times we walk. I'd like to ask the gal her name, but we don't get time to talk. <laughs> oh, the dimples in her cheeks. And the freckles on her back. Brother Jack, what a shame she married Jack. <laughs> and she loves my brother Jack. There we are, eh, George. That's it. You didn't have any baked bean and marmite, so I got you some shrimp and bother, all right? Oh, <laughs> So, your missus is out on the town tonight, is she? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she's gone to the dogs. Well, we all know that, but where's she going? <laughs> no, I mean, she's gone to the racetrack, hasn't she? With her, you know, and your ease. Oh, How she? Yeah, they've both gone dog racing. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, they'll probably lose all their money, won't they? Yeah. Finish up as paralytic as pigs, probably. <laughs> yeah. Get picked up by a couple of drunks, finish up an all night orgy in Earl's Court, should one. Yeah. Still, it keeps them out of mischief, don't it? <laughs> You're talking of mischief, far be it for me to pry into your sexual pro cavities. Yeah. But ever since you come into the bar, I couldn't help noticing that you've been wearing that frilly garter round the sleeve of your donkey jacket. Now, which, if, if my memory serves me correct, is not your usual custom, is it? No, you're right. Well, there is an explanation for that, George. I should damn well hope so. Yeah. <laughs> Remember the other weekend you and I went up west, didn't we? Yeah. Ended up at that, uh, you know, two o'clock in the morning. You remember, ended yeah. up at that drafty little strip club. Oh, yeah, the air and the G-string, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we had a few that night. We did. Two to tell, I don't really remember too much of what happened. Anyway, several days later, there was I at home, Lil, minding her own business, you see, rifling through my trouser pockets, and <laughs> she found this garter. You see, now, me, having me wits about me, I spruced her along that it was a black armband I bought for mourning for Uncle Cedric, you see, who, as luck would have it, had died the day before. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> it was lucky, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Very fortuitous indeed. Yeah. Not, of course, quite so lucky for Uncle Cedric, though. No, no. <laughs> of course not, no. Anyway, Lil being uh, very, um... What's his name? Oh, dear, would you, uh... What do you call it, you know, when somebody, uh, you know, believes everything you say? Thick. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Thick. 
that is right. That is thick. That's right. Yes, you're right. That's what she is, thick. Anyway, Lil, Lil being thick, as you said, she she believes she swallowed it. She yeah. swallowed everything, you see. <laughs> Only I've got to keep this on for two or three days. Otherwise, you're going to get very suspicious. Yeah. <laughs> Good job she didn't find that little brazier in your other pocket then, would it? Otherwise, <laughs> you'd been walking around with red satin here, Mum. <laughs> With them little holes to poke your earlobe through. <laughs> so, listen, how old was your old Uncle Cedric then when he kicked it then? He was the wrong side of 60. What was that? 94. <laughs> Mind you, for the last six months of his life, he had been shacked up with a young bird at 25. Well, he was 94, she was 25. Yeah. Oh. See, he was shacked out, wasn't he? <laughs> no, you see, he never had any kids of his own, you see, and no. apparently I think he wanted to carry on the family strain. Well, it would have been a strain, yeah, it would have been. <laughs> what did he die of, then? Terminal ecstasy or what? <laughs> I suppose so, yeah. It's funny, you know, isn't it, this life and death business, you know? It's very strange. I mean, I often sit here and think, why are we here? <laughs> well, the beer's cheaper, for one. <laughs> I don't mean why are we here. Why are we sitting in here in this pub having a pint in the Merry Thatcher? I don't mean that. I mean life's great external riddle. Yeah. Why do we exist? Well, it's something to do, isn't it? <laughs> and furthermore, what happens after it? Now, I, I heard on the television the other night, yeah. I saw this programme where they said that there's grounds for believing that there might be intelligent life on the other side. What, you mean on Channel 10? <laughs> <laughs> Channel 10, be realistic, Sid. Other life on Channel 10? Cool. <laughs> right. Now, what I'm talking about is <laughs> snuffing it. Yeah. Snuffing it is not the end of it all, you see. We may very well, you and me, end up in hell. Oh, I never thought of that. Never thought of that for one minute. I never did. Listen to hell. Of course. I wonder what hell's like, eh? Not a very nice place, I shouldn't think, would you? Well, of course it's not a very nice place, is it? Otherwise it wouldn't be hell, would it? No, no. it's a terrible <laughs> place. I always imagine it as some vast, bottomless pit, all burning, mm -hmm. where everyone is chained up and forced to eat shrimp and Bob Real Crisps throughout each other. <laughs> Bit like Root the Hill on a Friday. <laughs> <laughs> Suppose then, do you suppose that Uncle Cedric is in fact in here at this present moment? No, 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 no. No, I've got a theory about that. I reckon that even now your Uncle Cedric has been reincarnated. Reincarnated? What do you mean? Reincarnated is when you come back into this life for something else, you know. Mm. I reckon if I had to come back into this life for something else, I would like to come back as an hyena. As an hyena? Why yeah. do you want to come back as a hyena? Well, if you come back as an hyena, you're laughing, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you've got all that beautiful African sunshine, you wouldn't be forced to eat bleeding crisps all day, either, would you? <laughs> no, I wouldn't want to come back as a hyena, not me. No, not with my feet. But you wouldn't have your feet, would you? You'd be a hyena, would you? I mean, you wouldn't be a hyena tramping through the jungle wearing two pairs of black brogues and a set of odour eaters, would you? <laughs> you would have the hyena's feet, would you? Yeah. But I still wouldn't want... It wouldn't be me, you see, it wouldn't be... I think if I come back as any, I'd like to come back as a giraffe. <laughs> you as a giraffe? <laughs> Why do you want to be a giraffe? Well, it'd stop you picking your noses, <laughs> My Lil now, I wonder what my Lil would come back as. What would you? Uh, your Lil, great white whale, I should wonder. <laughs> I suppose you're right, really, with all the whale bones and the corsets and all that blubber, yeah. she got a head start. <laughs> well, she nearly got harpoon when you took her paddle in the Clacton, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> hey, what's that? Oh, look at that. Look at the time I've got to get out of here. Oh, blimey. Yeah, I've got to put my black armband on now. What? You're not going to funeral and all, George, are you? No, I'm going up Lords to see the cricket. England are batting against Australia. You oh. coming? Yeah. <laughs> Here now is one of Ronnie Barker's favourite sketches. He loved it because of Ronnie Corbett's performance. That was jolly good, that was. Thanks very much. I really enjoyed that. <laughs> It's a super game, isn't it? I don't know why I've never tried it before. <laughs> but I can assure you, my dear chap, from now on, thanks to you, I should be a dedicated squish player. <laughs> squash. Pardon? Squash. The game is called Squash. Oh, yes, yeah, Squash, that's right, yes. Um, tell me, who, who actually won? I wasn't quite sure about the, the sort of scoring uh, technique of it. I mean, did I win? You flame. You... 
You won. You won. Oh yes, yes. I thought. And 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 how many goals did I get? <laughs> goals. Yeah. Well, well, thing is, thing is, you know, runs. Uh, were... Points. Points. Yes. Points. Yes. How many? I mean, how many did I actually score? What was the score? Look, the score was game love, game one, game love, game love. <laughs> yes. You won by four games to love. Oh, good. That's good. You mean I scored four and you scored love? Yeah. Ah, I see. And how many is love? <laughs> <laughs> love is nothing. You know. Oh, I see. Oh, no, that's not right, no, because I remember distinctly, you did get a point early on, didn't you? Yes. Yes, only because you had... Oh, I know, I was holding the thing by the wrong end, wasn't I? <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to push it, yes, I remember that, yes. Yes, I must remember, you hold the bat by the thin end. The racket. The racket, the racket, yes, the racket. This is a racket, you yes. see what I mean? Yes. The game is called squash. Yes. We play it with a ball, and this is a plastic racket. <laughs> 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 Will it work now you've done that? <laughs> Look, I don't care. Do you understand? I don't care. Because I'm not going to play squat anymore. Ever. Do you understand? Oh, I say, that's a bit sad, really, isn't it? I mean, I was hoping I was going to come back next week and see if I could do a bit better. <laughs> <laughs> a bit better. A bit better. Look, matey. <laughs> I am the secretary of this squash club. You understand that? You know, I am the captain of the team. You know, last year I won the singles final in squash. You know. I played for the state in squash, you know, the first team. You know, you know, I'm one of the best players around about here, to be honest. You know, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Good. You know. <laughs> You haven't played before, have you? You're vastly overweight. I mean, you know, you're lumbering about the court there. I mean, you come on to that bloody court in your Grace Brothers suit. <laughs> and you thrash me. You pulverise me. Grown me into the dust. In front of my friends, that's what I... I mean, in front of my friends. You grown... You humiliated me. How did you do it? How did you do it? Beginner's luck. <laughs> it's a fluke, mate. A fluke, matey. Well, it won't happen again. It won't happen the next time. You understand? Oh, well, you, you can't play again because you've broken your rocket. Racket! Racket! <laughs> Doesn't matter. I'll get a new one, you see. I'll get a new one. And I shall be back here tomorrow on this very court challenging you 10 o'clock tomorrow. Oh, no, sorry, not tomorrow. No, no can do. What do you mean, no can do? Well, I've got to go up to a place called Lords. There's two fellas called Gatting and Botham. They're teaching me to play Cracket or something. <laughs> <laughs> First met Dick down a dirty duck, didn't I, Dick? Yeah! Two musicians down on our luck, wasn't we, Dick? Yeah! We both sat down and had some beer, and he comes up with a great idea. We play in the street for the world to hear, didn't you, Dick? Yeah! <laughs> we soon became the best of chums, didn't we, Dick? Yeah! I played the piccolo, he played the drums, didn't you, Dick? Yeah! But I had shouted off, so we knocked it on the head, and we formed a one-man band instead. The two of us, just me and Ted, did we, Ted? Yeah! I go bang, he goes clang, I go squeak, and he goes twang. I go bump, he goes thump, I go crash, and he go bump. I go whiz, he goes ting, I go bonk, and he goes ping. We're renowned throughout the land. We're the only two man, one man band. <laughs> the barmaid's nice and the dirty duck, isn't she, Dick? Yeah. She gave us a kiss and she wished us luck, didn't she, Dick? Yeah. She said, as I'm always telling you, son, two at a time is better than one. Twice the manpower, twice the fun, <laughs> didn't she, Dick? Not off. I go, he goes, I go, and he goes, he sometimes, when we should go, boo. When he goes, I leave the room. He goes, I go, and he goes, we're renowned throughout the land. We're the only.
bang, he goes clang, I go squeak, and he goes quang. I go bump, he goes thump, I go crash, and he goes thump. I go whiz, he goes ting, I go bonk, and he goes pink. We're in our throughout the land. We're the only two men what my band. This is The Two Ronnies Unseen, featuring their performances on Australian television, produced back in 1986. Good evening. Australia in the 21st century. What will it be like? Well, we in the government have got together various economic forecasters with their crystal balls, and one or two with glass eyes, <laughs> to look into the future. Now, over the next 20 years, high technology will gradually replace natural manpower in all walks of life. Now, here, for example, is the new microchip, Richie Benno. <laughs> Very simple to operate, and as you can see, much more animated. <laughs> In your shops now. The, uh, the new generation of metallic performers will, of course, replace the wooden ones currently in use on neighbours. <laughs> All actors will have to be oiled before going on stage. Or in the case of Oliver Reed, well oiled. <laughs> the advent of cable and satellite TV will give you a much wider range of television programmes. By the year 2000, you will be able to choose from 567 different channels using this handy remote control device. There we are. <laughs> different channels, of course, will cater for the interests of different specialist groups. And of course, ABC will continue to provide its own unrivaled programmes of minority interest. <laughs> such as 101 things to do if you're laid up in bed with John Michael Housen. <laughs> now, it is also estimated that come the year 2010, Australia won't have a cricket team. So, no change there. <laughs> and personal recreation well research shows that by the end of the century, sex will be replaced by snooker. As man's favourite pastime, that is. <laughs> this won't make a great deal of difference, although some men will need a longer rest. <laughs> Others will need a longer vest. But... <laughs> but what about the elderly? 85-year-old Mr Arthur Cretis of Wanala writes as follows. When is the government going to stop ignoring the old-age pensioner? Next. <laughs> What will be left of Australia's green belt? Well, here is a bird's eye view. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's a bird's eye pee. I'm off. <laughs> yes. Ah, there it is, you see? Now, all that will be left of our unspoiled countryside will be this 25-acre golf course here in my back garden in Melbourne, <laughs> where trespasses will be shot, but only if they're in season. <laughs> now, there will also be great strides forward in our space programme. Already, plans are underway to fire a game show host into outer space to make sure it's safe for a monkey. <laughs> but it's not all good news, no? What can we expect from Medicare? Well, due to stringent new medical standards, no one will be admitted into hospital unless they're 100% fit. <laughs> this will unfortunately lead to slight delays in treatment. Migraine sufferers will have to put up with a little pain in the head, and lumbago sufferers will have to put up with a little pain in the back. <laughs> Hemorrhoid sufferers <laughs> will receive a visit from John McEnroe. <laughs> Finally, what changes will there be in the government itself? Well, politics will become much more commercialised, and by the end of the century, we could see Houses of Parliament sponsored by Andrew's liver salts. <laughs> this will greatly speed up the passing of amendments. <laughs> Parliament will be dissolved every four hours in a glass of water. <laughs> Office conditions throughout Canberra will be vastly improved. It's estimated that six out of every ten civil servants will have their own polished mahogany desk. And four out of ten will have a secretary on top of that. <laughs> All these civil servants by them will, of course, be replaced by clockwork models, so their secretaries will each be issued with one of these keys. And that just about winds it up. Or if it doesn't, you may need a bigger key. Good night. <laughs> Rosby, uh, can you suggest something for a headache? I haven't got a headache. 
No, no, not you, dear. No, 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 you no, me, me. Oh, never mind. Send in a cup of herbal tea, if you don't mind. And the next patient, please. seems to be the trouble. <laughs> I've got a hatchet in my head. Good heavens, so you have. I noticed it as you came through the door, but I thought, I thought it was some sort of hat. It is some sort of hat. Yes, what sort? The painful sort. <laughs> Dear, I'm sorry. Is it causing you some discomfort? Of then? course it is. Of course it is. Yes, it does look. Does look very sore, I must say. You see, of course, you've got it here, haven't you? Bang here, you have it. Right between the sex drive and the ability to sew on buttons. <laughs> Would you do something about it, please? Yes, certainly. What is your name, please? Spe <laughs> Initials? TK. Look, I failed to see what Date this Date of birth, please. <laughs> August the 4th, 1930. Oh, well, that's it. Typical. What do you mean, typical what? Typical Leo. Leo? <laughs> Leo, fire sign, fire, metal, hatchet. It is a fireman's hatchet, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yes. <laughs> and, of course, it's the 11th of the month. You were bound to get a hatchet in your head. <laughs> I mean, it's curious, this, because you won't believe this, but I've just written a paper on the very subject. <laughs> that should... Perhaps you'd care to read it. No, thanks. I don't feel like reading. I've got a splitting headache. Well, me too, I can assure you. Yeah, but I've got hatchet in mind. <laughs> to the untutored eye, outwardly, yes. Some of it is inwardly. <laughs> it hurts. Look, I am the doctor, Mr. Spat. Will you please allow me to be the judge of what does and what does not hurt? <laughs> now, please. Do you get tingling at the end of the finger? No, 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 no. All the tingling is confined to my head. That's because of the hatchet. Look, let us not jump to conclusions. This hatchet in the head may be the symptom of something far worse. Well, far worse? How can it be far worse? Look, this is an emergency. Will you do something about it, please? If only you'd come to me ten years ago. <laughs> I've only just got it. A lifetime of sitting in the wrong posture, possibly, or a diet of red meat. I mean, you didn't even know your birth sign, did you? Of course you're going to get a hatchet in your head. Will you just pull it out, please? <laughs> you see, in this case, we have to treat the whole man. What about the hole in the man? <laughs> <laughs> what kind of doctor are you, anyway? Look, you are living out of accord with nature, you see. Your yin and your yang are out of... You see, you're, fe <laughs> you're, feeling, you're feeling alienated, violent. It's not me that's violent. It's the man upstairs who's stuck in my head. He's a violent one. Look, even the man upstairs obeys orders from outer forces. Oh, I forget it. I'm just going to an ordinary hospital outpatient. Sorry about it. Ingrateful amateurs. What do you know of the cosmos? Look, you are a windbag, a gas bag and a crank, and I hope you sit on your own acupuncture needles. <laughs> Ingrate. <laughs> the headache's completely gone. <laughs> It says here, there is no recession. All I can say is, if this isn't a recession, it must be the worst boom in history. <laughs> now, everybody's got more money than he used to have. I haven't. I have skit. Didn't you just have an uncle die? No. No, I got an auntie die. <laughs> Married to Fred. Oh, it was your auntie, was it? <laughs> no, auntie didn't die. She is alive. It was Fred. He's dead. Fred. Dead. <laughs> How much money did he leave then? Well, all of it. You have to, don't you? <laughs> but none of it to me. I am truly veracic. Well, like me. I haven't got two apenies to scratch the soles of my feet with. Well, I don't need money. I do. Oh, I do. I've asked for money, I've begged for money, I've cried for money. Well, why don't you work for it? <laughs> I'm going through the alphabet. I haven't got the W yet.
The two Ronnies traditionally closed their shows with a song. This bittersweet number written by Ronnie Barker doesn't play for laughs, but reminds us what highly accomplished actors the two Ronnies were. People don't want clowns no more. We seem to be out of fashion now. We seem to have lost our dash somehow. We seem to have lost our clout. People don't think we're funny no more. Comedy seems to have passed us by. It's just moved on, don't ask us why. Left, Left us down, down and out. out. But I remember the day when everyone loved the clown. I remember the day whenever the circus came to town. All the kids in the neighborhood ran after you down the street. Everyone's next door neighbor would knock on the wall as hard as they could. They're here, they're here. Come out and give them a cheer. And the elephants holding each other's tails came lumbering through the crowd. Pulling the cages which held the lions and the liberty horses Trotting proud of the men, the stilts and the acrobats Came tumbling through the town And behind them all, two tremendous cheers The hero of the day appears The clown, the clown, the clown. The clown. Everyone loved the clown Everyone loved the clown <laughs> People don't want clouds no more. Things we do don't make them laugh. The comical car that falls in half no longer stops the show. People don't go for our gags no more. The slippery planks and the buckets of paste, it's sheer hard graft just gone to waste. And nobody wants to know But I remember the day When the clowns were the only thing I remember the day when Ever we entered the circus ring That joyful sound, that magical roar Would surge up from the crowd And as each prattful shook the floor And little Joey came back for more The laughs were loud The laughs were loud and loud And the flower bags bursting all over the place And the custard pies that flew And the soda siphon full in the face And the baggy trousers filled with blue Jock on his square wheel bicycle And Jimbo's gigantic ears And the final chase round the edge of the ring And you feel no pain And the only thing are the cheers The cheers You never forget the cheers People don't want clowns no more I tend to blame the telly myself That's what's put us on the shelf That's what did us in It's too sophisticated now There's entertainment round the clock from breakfast TV to late night rock, it's one long bleeding din. Too many of us at it now, they're at it all day long. Everyone's jumped on the gravy train, competition's too strong. There's quiz shows, talent shows, the adverts wall to wall. The men who talk of politics, the biggest clowns of all. Still, come on, Jacko, we can't sit here. There's two more shows tomorrow night, two more chances to get it right, providing family fun. Let's get moving, there's a dear. It's half past 12 and I'm soaking wet. And we've got to muck out the elephant yet. <laughs> Come on, or oh, we'll never get done. Well, 
I'm afraid that's all we have time for this week. Next week, we shall be talking to Australia's oldest working milkman, who's just become a father at 71, and at 23, and at the larches as well. <laughs> So we'll also be talking to Angus McTavish of the Sydney Caledonian Society, who, when asked to do something Glaswegian on Burns Night, was sick in a phone box. <laughs> <laughs> and in the back programme, we shall be meeting the world's greatest basketball team, which recently changed to a high fibre diet and are now known as the Harlem Bogtrotters. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll be meeting Elastic Jack the contortionist who puts his legs behind his ears and makes a spectacle of himself. <laughs> <laughs> and it's good night from me. And it's good day from him. Good, good day. day.